do we have government controlled churches here in America? The sad answer to that is yes, we do. Okay, and uh, I'm going to get into that in this video here real quickly. Back, I guess it's about three or so years ago now, when we started our house church, we really wanted to know everything, all the legal issues and everything. What about this 501c3 thing? Um, we listened to a message by Dr. Scott Johnson, and he was talking about 501c3, and I could definitely see, yeah, there's some major issues there with church and corporation. And he recommended Peter Kershaw's videos. So we went to Peter Kershaw's website, and they were all in VHS at that time. And, you know, the people of the church, we all went together and we bought a copy of his seminar series and his one book in Caesar's Grip. And didn't hear anything, didn't hear anything, didn't hear anything. Well, here, just a few months ago, Peter Kershaw finally sent uh, everything. He sent us uh, the book in Caesar's Grip and then the whole seminar on DVD instead of VHS, which I'm happy for that. And, you know, he, he had some family issues and things. You know, he didn't really elaborate, and, I'm, you know, it's fine. And so, you know, it took him a while to send the stuff. So we, you know, pretty much figured things out a little bit on our own. But I definitely learned a lot from these videos. And if you are really serious about a house church and you're really, you want to do it the right way and everything, there's going to be some things that you should really invest in and study on your own. I mean, I can answer a lot of your questions, but some of this stuff, you just, you got to see it for yourself. You know, the Lord will bless uh, you as you study, okay? You can't expect to just go out and learn everything from other people as far as, you know, not doing your own work or putting out money for something as good as this. But uh, really some interesting information in here. And I just want to go over some of the things that I learned in this video series. Haven't read the book yet. Just kind of glanced through it, read little portions here and there, but I really need to put some time aside and read this thing. Uh, one of the most amazing things that I learned from the first DVD is that our founding fathers, the real power behind the revolution was actually the preachers, the nonconformist preachers. A lot of the quote-unquote founding fathers were not Christian men. Men like Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson were deists, and Ben Franklin was a lot worse than that. Another subject. But the nonconformist preachers were the ones that really pushed for the thing of, you know, seceding from the king of England. Okay, and what was the main reason? Well, what's the First Amendment? Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of religion or the free exercise thereof. That's the very first one. Freedom of religion and freedom of speech. That's the very first part. And who established it? It wasn't a bunch of liberal people that wanted to go fornicate or something like that. No, it was our Christian pastors here in America, the nonconformist preachers, the preachers that would rather die than take a license from the government. Patrick Henry told a story about how he rode into a town and he actually saw a man being scourged like Jesus was, scourged, and Patrick Henry said you could see the man's ribs coming through his back where the, where the whip with little pieces of metal on it was ripping the flesh away. And, P and Patrick Henry said, what is this man's crime? What has he done? And they said, he's a preacher who will not take a license. Now, how many preachers would do that today here in America? They willingly, and I, I don't blame the preachers so much as I blame the lawyers. You know, these Christian lawyers that go out there and tell these preachers to go out and get incorporated under the headship of the government and become 501c3 tax-exempt corporations when they already have tax exemption. You don't have to go to the government and beg, you know, can we please preach? Can we? Can we? Can you give us a license? Can you give us your permission? It's just very, very messed up, very far away from not only what our founding fathers stood for, but also from what the Bible teaches 
I mean, please show me some scripture where the Lord said, go ye into all nations and, you know, preach the gospel to every creature, but first go down to the local Roman magistrate and get a license. Show it to me. It's not in there. And you say, well, you know, it's not a big deal and everything. Well, the government doesn't always enforce the laws of 501c3, but the fact of the matter is, and this is in my house church video, you lose your First Amendment rights when you incorporate with the government. You do. You're not allowed to speak against the politicians, and you are not allowed to do anything to influence legislation. You lose your First Amendment right. And there are all these preachers, you know, they get controversial and they'll, and they'll cut on Obama or say something bad about Obama, and the, and the police come in and say, you do that again, we're going to take you to jail. And the, pre the pastors righteously stand up and say, you have no right. I have freedom of religion. No, you don't. If you signed up as a 501c3, you don't have freedom of religion anymore. You don't have freedom of speech. You are a creature of the state. I'm not making that up. A incorporated church is a creature of the state. Let me show you some of the other dangers. You say, well, we need to be able to write off our giving on our taxes, you know, so we can get money back. Oh, is that what really giving to the Lord means? Lord, I'm going to give you this, my tithes and offerings, but I'm going to write it off of my taxes so I can get money back. Bad idea. And by the way, something that's actually interesting, when you write off 10% of your income on your tax return, the IRS looks at that and they say, wait a second, what's going on here? Where's this 10% of their income? Where's that going? Actually writing off your tithes and offerings can actually invite litigation from the IRS. Did you know that? And I know of numerous couples that give generously, you know, they give a lot of money to ministries and they write it off in their taxes and they've been audited. Something to think about there. Okay, and you know, it really comes down to a matter of obedience to the Word of God or convenience. Show me anywhere where Christians are, ta are giving to the work of the Lord and then writing it off on their taxes. Show me that in the Bible. Oh, but it's so nice and convenient and everything. Yeah, uh-huh. Another statement he made during the seminar, which was very good, was, you don't have any rights unless you know them. <laughs> Thought that was pretty good. Now, if you want to be a house church, you do need to write up some official papers and everything just in case somebody tries to take you to court. It doesn't have to be signed by a lawyer or anything else. We're actually working on that right now at Bible Believers Fellowship. But you need to call yourself a free church. It's not that we're anti-government and we won't let the government, you know, do it. No, 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 no. We support godly government that is a terror to evil and not to good. That's the kind of thing we support. But the government has no jurisdiction over our church. We are a free church under the headship of Jesus Christ according to the Pauline epistles, the teachings found in the Pauline epistles primarily. Of course, we're not hyper-dispensationalists. You know, we you know, read the whole New Testament and rightly divide it. Okay? Do not call yourself unincorporated or 508 or some other thing, you know, or a uh, corporation soul is the other one. Don't do that, okay? Not a good idea. Uh, as a free church, fire marshals and police have no jurisdiction over our meeting place. Just as they can't come and a bunch of people meeting for Christmas or Thanksgiving, the police can't come in there and say, you know, we have to do a stress test on your floors here or something. And the fire marshal comes in and says, you, you know, we need to check your fire alarm systems. No, it's a private home. And as a house church, you are a private meeting of people under the headship of Jesus Christ. Think about something else. If you're part of an incorporated thing or you're considering starting a church and thinking about going with incorporation, let me ask you something to you pastors out there. Who called you to preach? God or the government? You say, well, God called me to preach. Then why are you going to the government for permission? Something to think about. Uh, let's see. You should never call your meetings public, by the way. 
Uh, we believe in, in being in one accord. We want to talk to people before they can come and be part of our house church. It was done that way for many, many, many centuries. Okay, even here in America, the churches, you know, the church buildings and things, they wouldn't just accept anybody in as a member, you know. But now all of a sudden we have lost and saved people meeting together and everybody's welcome. Come as you are. Uh, bad idea. Very bad idea. Uh, another thing, when you become an incorporation, one of the things that you get is you, you'll have to, because you're a public now, you're a public entity, a creature of the state, you're going to have to have insurance. You know, why? Well, because you're a corporation. People can sue corporations. But as a free church, they can't just come in and say, we're going to sue the, the free church because the free church is not recognized by the government. It's not a creature of the state. But now, if you have a big insurance policy, and I used to go to a church, didn't have that many people, but it was a big property, you know, back in the glory days. And now they have just a few people going there. But that pastor had over a, he had over $1 million of insurance on himself in case he gave bad advice or something. Over a million dollar insurance policy? Now, what does that do? It invites people coming in and trying to sue you. Yeah. I mean, that, again, it's a bad idea. Uh, there's also something else about the church corporation, which is very bad. There's something called the deep pockets theory. Now, what this is, is that if you are an incorporated church and somebody comes in and sues you, and let's say you have a million dollar insurance policy, and somebody comes in and sues you for $1.5 million, so your insurance says, well, we'll cover the million dollars, but the $500,000, guess where that has to come from? In theory. Now, it's a theory. You know, if you went to court, it might not come up, but then again, it might. According to this theory, if your insurance doesn't cover the whole amount, the pastor who's considered the CEO and the deacon and the elders who are all part of that corporation, they can actually have to cover the costs if your insurance policy isn't big enough. And you say, well, that doesn't happen very often. No, I don't think it does, but it's there. That's pretty scary, okay? And, you know, if you're a, a registered member and everything of that church, I don't know, might even come back to you. Uh, another thing that you're going to get into if you have a big incorporated church is, you know, usually they build some huge building that they can't afford and they'll get themselves into a mortgage. So they actually owe. I thought the Bible says something about owe no man anything. Well, I don't know. Maybe that's not for today. You know, <laughs> but it's kind of interesting. He brought up a, a good point. I uh, never heard this before. You know what mortgage means? It's actually derived from the French language. Mort gage means death pledge. <laughs> thought that was pretty interesting. But you see, when you become an incorporated church, or if you're part of one, uh, you. If you're going to an incorporated church, i got to tell you something else, too, here. The church itself is a creature of the state, and the property that you are on is government property. Now, that church, under 501c3 rules, is not allowed to do anything to influence legislation or to speak against the political leaders. You're not allowed to do that. So you are giving up your First Amendment rights, not only the pastor, but even if you enter the property, you are on government land and you have forfeited your First Amendment rights. Now think about something. If they take away your First Amendment rights, what else could they take away? Perhaps your Second Amendment rights? And there are a lot of churches around this country right now, around America, that people are coming in and shooting the pastor or just shooting a bunch of people, well, the day could come when they will literally be gun-free zones. You say, well, they, they don't have a right. They couldn't tell our church to do that. We wouldn't obey. 
Well, then they can shut your doors because, you see, it's owned by the state. And something else I want to mention, too, here. This church I used to go to, it was a huge, big place. They could have gotten well over a million dollars for the property. Giant property, big, huge building. And we often said, you know, me and a couple other guys would go to the pastor, go to the other, you know, elders and things, and we would say, why are you holding on to this building? You guys don't need this big place. It's falling apart. It's costing you a lot of money. Sell it. Sell it and buy a smaller property. And they always kind of skirted the issue and would change the subject or whatever. Well, I now found out why they couldn't sell it. Because it wasn't their property. You say, what are you talking about? It belonged to the government. So the government, if that church would have closed its doors and said, we're declaring, you know, we're, we're no longer a church, we're dissolved, that church or the government would have taken that, their own property, and they would give it to somebody else. And you say, well, that wouldn't be too bad. It'd just be given to another church. Oh, not exactly. You see, it would be given to another 501c3 corporation. And you ought to study who gets 501c3 tax exemption. There are witchcraft churches. The Church of Satan, founded by Anton LaVey, is a 501c3 corporation. So you could literally have the government stepping in and saying Christianity is now illegal and revoking the church property, which they own, the government owns, and giving it to the Church of Satan. That could happen. Well, I don't know. I don't believe it's going to happen. Yeah, okay. Well, why don't you read your Bible sometime and show me in the book of Revelation where it says that people are just going to be freely allowed to worship wherever they want. It doesn't. It says that the whole world's going to worship the Antichrist. I wonder if they're going to be worshiping the Antichrist in the church buildings. You better believe it. They're going to be doing it. And how did the system come about? It came about because back in the 1960s, under Lyndon Baines Johnson, this 501c3 monster was created where the government now controls the churches here in America. I mean, you hear the stories about in China, communist China, and in Russia, how that the government owns the churches there. And you think, oh man, that would be horrible if it ever came here to America. It already has. And I was raised in churches, you know, and I always heard this thing about, you know, well, I, I, you know, election time would come up. Well, I can't tell you who to vote for, and I can't really say anything. And I was raised thinking, well, there's probably some kind of a thing in the Bible that says that you're not allowed to talk about the politicians or warn the people. I didn't know. And as I got older, I started to study the Bible, and I realized this isn't about the Bible. This is about 501c3. This is about the fact that the churches in America are government corporations. And, you know, you can get into the whole thing, too, of FEMA working with the pastors and actually the pastors going out and informing on their own flock. It's bad. And let me say one other thing in closing. You say, well, Brian, you know, you just haven't proved your case. I don't think it's really that bad of a thing for a church to seek official recognition under the government, 501c3. Not a big deal. We've been doing it for so long. Okay, well, let me say this. Let's say I'm driving through the city one day and I look and I see a prostitute on the street corner. And I go over and I, you know, start to flirt with her or something like that. And I say, hey, I'd like to marry you. And she says, oh, sure, that'd be great. And I marry a prostitute. So now I'm married to a lost woman. I'm unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. And she doesn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ, doesn't want anything to do with church. And she's going to go right on earning money as a prostitute. And I pray and I say, God, please bless my marriage. Is God going to answer that prayer? He can't. God can't bless a marriage that is contrary to the Word of God. And I'm going to tell you right now, God can't bless a church that is yoked up to the prostitute that is now our government, to this wicked, vile bunch of people, and I can say it because I'm a free church pastor, this wicked bunch of politicians that is wrecking this country. 
God's not going to bless a church that's yoked up to that. God might use it. You know, I'm not saying that there aren't churches out there that are 501c3, that, that there aren't souls getting saved and they aren't doing some things for the Lord, but it's not going to go on forever. And there have been case after case after case where these churches step out of line and the government comes in and says, you're, going to, you're not going to do that anymore. And the church protests, you know, and that you have no right and everything to, you know, you're, we're being persecuted for righteousness sake. And they go to court and the church loses. And you know why they lose? Because they're owned by the government. So I believe you're going to see house churches becoming more and more popular. And you better make sure you do the house church the right way, by the way. Watch out for some of these charismatic nuts out there. They have some really wacky ideas about house churches. Some very heretical things. Okay. So, but I do believe that there's going to be a, as time progresses here, there's going to be more and more, it's going to be more and more obvious that you can't be part of these incorporated churches. They're government owned. You are on government property when you go there. You want to learn more about this thing? And I'm not getting any money for this. Don't get excited. I'm just recommending. That's what I do here, okay? I recommend good products to people out there. It took me years and years and years to sort through all the mess out there. And so I want to make it easier for people. You want to see some good information, some things that will really help you to learn, help you to grow. I highly recommend these videos. Can't say a whole lot about the book. I think it's going to be excellent too, but you know, I haven't read it, so I can't really speak much on it. But uh, check out the videos by Peter Kershaw. Links are down there in the description box. Very important subject, and it's going to become more obvious as time goes on. So that's it. Thank you for watching.